Thank you. Uh, this work is actually with Joshua Shrez, uh, um, and he did the web uh, programming. Later, you'll see it. Um, I'm a computational disease modeler. Um, I develop disease models that will predict what will happen to a population over time, how many people will die, how many will have heart attacks, and things like this. Um, partially, I'm doing this because I want computers to understand diseases, and therefore, in the future, may be able to make some decision making and act as a doctor at some point. It may take a long time because currently we're not there yet. And one of the questions I'm asking is how much time it will take to actually computers uh, be able to help us and act instead of doctors. So I'm looking at um, other examples where computers started not knowing enough and then went to the point that they beat the human being or automated the way the human being kind of. Uh, look at computer chess, since the, you can see a timeline here, and you can actually find all of this in Wikipedia. Um, the first program, uh, since the first program till the time um, uh, that the computer went, uh, won against the world champion, it took about 50 years, more or less. Driverless cars, last year Waymo commercialized. They drove an incredible amount of miles autonomously with a fleet of vehicles and now it's commercial. The experiment started in 1977 uh, with a car staying between uh, lanes. So it took about 40 years. It took about 40 years for the, uh, uh, for the self-driving cars to get there. So computers cannot still act like doctors. They cannot really comprehend medicine yet, but little by little, I. Uh, uh, I assembled all sorts of examples that show that there's progress towards that. And I'm working on a very small niche of that. And uh, what are the things that allow us to make, it, it, make computers do things and automate humans away? Well, computing power, this is mostly what enabled chess, computing power and algorithms. Uh, for self-driving cars, it's actually sensors and data on top of it. For uh, medicine, we will need a lot of standardization and much more data. Data may come from other sources, but uh, standardization is key. I don't know exactly how much time it will take us, but uh, I asked several ex experts in the field. I asked them the same ex uh, uh, questions, and those are people who are dealing with medical uh, data from different perspectives. Um, so I asked them, when will computers automate some human medical decision tasks to allow applications such as computerized personal doctor? Um, Jeff Schrager, someone showed Eliza before about NLP. Well, uh, you, should, uh, you should see his uh, Eliza collection. He has a website of Eliza's. Uh, he works now um, in Excuse, he's the director of research there, and also he's associated with Stanford. Um, he says that many tasks in line of physicians are uh, already being automated, and that will accelerate. But the hard areas of active position, conversational problem solving, are far out on the utmost unforeseeable horizon at this point. Uh, he's actually talking about things like Siri not understanding human conversation, uh, or things like the doctor conversing with the patient. Um, there's much more. I shortened all of those uh, quotes from much, much, much more text that they, uh, people uh, sent me via email. Rocky Weston, for example, he's a chief medical information officer at Saperi Systems, a company that deals with medical data. Uh, he's an MD, he's an anesthesiologist. Uh, I believe this is already happening, though not explicitly. Currently, patients often look up their symptoms on the internet with inconsistent results. The chance for us is to make medical knowledge accessible, understandable, and accurate. So he also brings in challenges, but the challenges are a little different. And you'll see different people with different perspectives bring different challenges. Uh, Olaf Daman, he's a professor, he's also in uh, medical education. He's a professor and vice chair in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at Tufts. Um, he said, technically, we could certainly have a prototype between five or 10 years. The main obstacles are ethical, professional concerns of reliability and accreditation, philosoph philosophical challenges, and knowledge management. Um, a few more opinions. 
Bob Armstrong, he's a computer scientist by education, but he's been dealing with medical data for quite a long time. Uh, he has multiple titles. One of them is the executive uh, director of, uh, of Simulation Center of Immersive Learning at Virginia, East Virginia uh, Medical School. He says probably in about a decade the technology will be mature. However, changing the culture will make adoption of such technology delay in about eight more years. He's also looking at the aspects that are not computational, and those are important. Um, Richard Boyd, actually, uh, he's a CEO of Tanger and also a co-founder of uh, and chair of Ultim, which is a company that deals with uh, um, also uh, mo medical modeling. Um, he's kind of more conservative. He's saying by 2030, uh, average income Americans will have some sort of... Uh, for form of telemedicine to diagnose them. Healthcare interventions will be prescribed by an AI expert with a human doctor signature still required. Policy will trail available technology ca capabilities by 10 years. So he's looking far out there. Um, and uh, he actually wrote a nice article about this. You can uh, look it up on online. So you can see the opinions of when this will happen span between, oh, it's already happening, to a few decades away, but it is within those time frames I showed you at the beginning. I say it will not happen unless we standardize the medical data, and there is a big problem there. I'm going to start showing it to you. Let's look at clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, people know that clinical trials are being conducted by all sorts of entities. Uh, in the past, to look at clinical trials result, clinical trial results, you had to go and look at the medical literature first on paper. Today, it's electronic. Sometimes you have access to it. Sometimes you don't because sometimes you have to pay. Uh, but uh, more and more, this is becoming more and more available. Uh, uh, the government has noticed this. The U.S. government. Uh, so they actually passed a law. The law was uh, passed a few years ago, but it kicked in last year, actually 2017. And the law says that now you have to register all clinical trials, well, actually, all of, some of them. It depends on exactly the definition of what trial, but some clinical trials have to be registered within a database. The database is called clinicaltrials.gov. The NIH and the National Library of Medicine are responsible for this database, and it's growing fast. It's a great resource. The guys did the, uh, the guy did, the guys who handled this did a great job in assembling all of the data from all those clinical trials. You can download it and you can actually start processing the data there. Um, the only problem is that as much effort as they put into the, into assembling all the data, you have a Tower of Babel, uh, kind of, uh, problem there because Many, many entities are entering the data, and the data is not coming in standardized. And for example, I'm looking at the numbers of clinical trials. When they came out, I'm looking at how many people had, an, uh, had some sort of outcome and what was the uh, structure of the population. Those are things I need for my modeling. Uh, to understand the numbers, I have to understand the units. If someone knows the Gashasha Hivera, they have this famous sketch about... Uh, uh, one asks how much, and the one says seven, seven what? What did you ask about the seven? The, 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 number, the numbers are meaningless without the units. Um, so I'm looking only at the units at clinicaltrials.gov. In 30,000 uh, trials, 35,000 trials that actually have numbers in, uh, in them, meaning the people entered the results of the trial, they had 24,000 different units, actually a bit more. You can see the numbers are growing and they will keep on growing. So there's too many units, it doesn't make sense. And this is because people are entering data as text. Uh, I'll answer uh, questions at the end and you'll see some examples. Um, so to understand the numbers, I have to understand the units. I can't understand the units unless those are standardized. So what am I trying to do? I'm actually looking at all the data from clinicaltrials.gov, assembling or downloading all the data and processing it little by little. And eventually, 
I take all of the units that I found in clinicaltrials.gov, and now I'm trying to map them into existing unit standards. And there are several of those. Even then, there are several languages people are speaking. So for example, there's uh, one very uh, good uh, standard organization is called CDISC. It's Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. Uh, uh, they publish many standards. One of them has a terminology standard that deals with units. I took all the units from there. Uh, there were about, um, I found about 4,000 different names of units. And, and I won't go into the details because they're like about 1,000, but you have to look at the synonyms as well. So about 4,000 I took from there. Um, I went and uh, took a, a standard uh, from NIST. Uh, uh, NIST actually adopts standards for medical devices that um, uh, uh, is used by uh, IEEE and ISO. Um, so it's called RTMMS, uh, and you can later download this presentation, have links, uh, look at the links of all those uh, standards. Um, there's also unit ontology on BioPortal, which is um, uh, not really a standard, it's not a standardized body, but uh, it has a lot of useful information, I extract units from there. And finally, there's Okum. Okum is a way of actually assembling units from a base uh, uh, vocabulary of units to construct more complex units. Both CDISC and RTMMS use Okum and reference it. Also, there are other standards, like if you heard of FHIR, which is a, a standard for medical devices, also uses OCUMS. So I took OCUMS as well and added it to, to the mix. Now I have four standards, and I'm trying to map all of the units that uh, people added in clinicaltrials.gov that come from all the clinical trials out there which is kind of the representative of all the medical knowledge that's easily accessible, and it's quite a lot of it. And I'm trying to standardize the units. And to do this, I'm doing two things. NLP, a little bit, and then some machine learning. And the idea is to actually do this only to help the humans later do the classification, because we want humans to, to do the classification, and for this, we created the website. So let's start with what I'm doing here. Looking at natural language processing here, uh, it's not like the word level that people were showing you before. It's at the character level. I'm looking at engrams, and um, I'm trying to find proximity between words, and either for engrams or for other techniques. I'm using uh, two Python libraries to do this. And what you see here, and uh, by the way, throughout the presentation, the entire presentation is made with PyVis tools, and you'll see some of it is interactive. You can later download it. Um, so here I'm using Holoviews to show uh, the uh, uh, matrix that uh, I'm getting. But I'm only showing a very small part of the matrix, the first 30 uh, units that are used most at the clinicaltrials.gov. And uh, you can see the proximity between units. So you see participants with big P and small p, well, very, very close to each other. So proximity is one. But uh, if you compare it to uh, milligram to deciliter, well, those are two different units, so it's zero. And this is only lexical comparison, very easily derived, and I just do it between each unit and each other possible unit. So this matrix, eventually, I want to map, I also map it to all of the other auxiliary units, which are the ones that come from standards, which are about uh, almost 6,000 of those, and I create a huge matrix. Let me show you how this matrix looks like eventually. And before I, I'll go back and show you what I'm trying to do with this matrix, I'm trying to cluster all the units that are the same together because eventually I want to show it to a human and I want the human to see all the units that are look, look the same in the same page or something like that or in the same cluster. I don't want uh, the human to see a... a a, a, a nanogram to met a, a milliliter at, a, at one and then the same uh, unit with the space at number 2000 by, by the time they forgot they ever saw uh, number one. So, for example, I want all the percentage of participants, all of them kind of together. So, when I look at this uh, uh, big matrix, 
what I'm showing you is before clustering, this is its structure. You can actually see dense, darker areas. The darker it is, this means that uh, it's less organized. After clustering, you can see the diagonal here. Each unit is always uh, uh, resembles itself, so the diagonal should be dominant, but also you can see small squares around it. Those small squares are a product of the clustering algorithm that I applied. Uh, I used uh, scikit-learn, and I actually didn't use some of the techniques they were talking about before. I used a uh, uh, batch, a uh, uh, k-means, but uh, at batch level to conserve memory, and I actually did this multiple times. So I did three clustering passes. I'm going to show them to you. The first pass is this. Second pass, you can see the matrix is a little bit uh, uh, lighter, the proximity matrix. This is because I used a little bit slightly different uh, distance function. The second one, the second pass is also a slightly dis uh, different distance function, so the matrix is a bit lighter. But you can see each one of those times I created the 100 clusters. Then I assembled all of those clusters, combined them together, and did some uh, management of all the units that didn't fall into those, put them back into clusters, and then I got a nice uh, clustering algorithm that uh, looks nice and behaves nice. Um, you can see here also I'm showing the distance be uh, from the center of the clusters in green. So before clustering, you'd see it kind of jumbled up, but here you see it more ordered after clustering. And if you look only at the cluster numbers, again, you can see here that this is the cluster number that each unit belongs to, each row in the ma matrix. Uh, at the beginning, before clustering, well, it's all over the place. After clustering, you can see it rises up very nicely. But basically, this is what I did with the machine learning part. Um, this is possible due to uh, PyVis technology, this is the type of visualization, because think about it, this matrix is 25,000 rows by 25,000 co columns. Uh, 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 PyVis uses whole views and data shader to actually generate an, uh, this matrix and show it interactively the way I show, I'm showing it now. Finally, after I assembled and clustered all the units, we created a website. Actually, Josh created the website. Um, and I'm going to show it to you. And the website allows you to look at those clusters. We're showing only at the better level. Uh, the, the website is at the better level. We're showing only three clusters just to give you a sense of what's going on. And the idea of the website is help the human to actually go and map those. So not one human, multiple users are now able to go and map those units. So you can see, for example, here, four units that are the same for number three to six. Uh, those are basically the same unit. Different people entered them into the database from different sources, and they just used sometimes uh, different characters to uh, represent uh, divisions, sometimes different spaces. The system will allow you to sh it will show you all sorts of suggest suggestions that are close that the user can choose from, and then map those units, basically do the tagging or basic classification. Later on, after this is done once, we can, let, we, we can talk about a machine doing it. But first, we need a human to do it once. And we're trying to reduce the burden on the human to do this. So this is why this website exists. Um, and this is an ongoing project. We, what I'm showing you now is in the middle, hopefully in some point out. In some time in the future, I'll come back here and tell you what happened to it. Um, also, you can see the actual clinical trials. Uh, for each unit, how many times it's used in clinical trials. So this unit is used 15 times. What is it used for? And later on, you can actually go to the clinical trial and just click on the web. And if the website, and if the web will work, and yes, it works. It goes to clinicaltrials.gov and you can actually find the clinical trial we we're looking at and you can find what this unit is associated with. This is important to, for the user to actually figure out what a unit is and what is it used for before it's being classified. The system will show you things like Unicode characters. People love adding, copying and pasting from PDFs which have all sorts of funny uh, Unicode characters. And the system will show you that. 
But most importantly, the system will suggest uh, standardized units and will mark it to the user. For example, this unit, suggested unit, uh, gram to deciliter, is both is represented both in UKUM, in RTMS, and in CDISC. This means that this unit is well standardized. Everyone knows it. So if it really is the unit that represents this, well, actually, in this case, no, we might want to use it rather than another unit. And uh, if we look down, you can see in many cases, the system will give us suggestions that are uh, standardized units ahead of uh, other units. And the user also, of course, can map things manually. And here's an example where a user actually mapped things manually, and the system will always show the manual mapping first, because if a user already mapped it, this means someone has already put thought into it. So this is suggested to another user as a, ma as a mapped unit, and it will show how many users mapped each unit. Um, so basically, that's the idea behind the website. The website is accessible. You can actually uh, go, just go to clinicalunitmapping.com and try it on yourself and see what's going on. Um, when, after, since we already have this website, we have the tools to actually start the project. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to unify um, all those units and we're trying to go to, standardized, uh, to standard bodies and actually suggest the system to allow, um, allow uh, standardization of the unit. So we're in touch with SISO, which is a, a simulation interoperability standards organization. Um, this is an open standard organization, meaning it's standards that they're published are free uh, and accessible for people. So this is one just like all open source software. So this is why we're doing this. Uh, we're also, hopefully, we'll get in touch with CDISC. Uh, we'll be, uh, hopefully, in, in October, we'll get something done there. Uh, we'll see what will happen. Eventually, we want this, those tools to be migrated into the UMLS. This is a long-term thing, uh, but for example, if we get into CDISC, CDISC every six months or so, it gets absorbed into UMLS. What is UMLS? It's the Unified Medical Language System, which is a set of standards that includes many things except units. Uh, it's handled by the NIH, and um, it has uh, examples uh, such as terminology standards, uh, 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 standards uh, like Rx norm for drugs and other standards that are all being absorbed. So hopefully we'll get there as well. Uh, we will see. We did some work before that and you can see some of the publications are available here. You can actually download them later, uh, hopefully. And um, whenever I'm showing something, I usually write down some of the producibility information because science, we want it to be reproducible. Uh, you will be able to access the code that actually generated this presentation uh, using panel uh, for this link. And to actually download this presentation, you can take a picture of this QR code. It will lead you to the website. And all of the things I've showed you, you'll be able to click and play around with. Um, I do want to thank many people that help in many ways. Their names are here. I won't go each, each person by name, but uh, I do want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the PyVis team, the PyVis team that uh, created all those visual tools that allowed me to show, show it to you visually and interactively. I want to sum up and say, we don't really know how much time it will take until uh, computers will become uh, uh, computerized doctors uh, and will be able to prescribe medicine for us and uh, be with us all the time rather us having to go to the doctor. This will, it's hard to predict the time and I showed you some predictions by multiple experts in the field. However, a major obstacle is standardization and Python can help there and this is what I just showed you. Uh, I am open for questions if you have any. Okay, uh, the question is what organization am I? I'm a sole proprietor, I'm independent. I actually started this project independently and also my modeling work is independent. You can look me up online. 
The question is, why do I need uh, machine learning to help with this? Uh, what I need is to ask the doctors to actually help with the standardization process. Um, well, yes and no. I actually do, there are two aspects here. Yes, we eventually want humans to classify those units. This is important because you don't want the machine to make all sorts of silly mistakes that, this is why we created the website that will help the standardization process. Eventually it's a human process. However, without the machine learning to suggest things that the machine already sees that are close, the task for the humans will be so hard and so unhospitable that uh, humans will burn up very quickly doing this. Uh, try to go to a website and try to map one or two units and see how much time it takes you. I have 25, 4,000 different units. Finding enough people to do this and do this at a regular pace it's hard. We want to make it as easy on them as possible and therefore the machine learning is. The machine learning is to cluster all the things that look the same together. I can show you on the website how I can, here, I'll show you a different set of units if, I, if the internet will work. Here, I just click to a different set of units and now uh, internet is, yeah. Internet is slow but you can see it's, it's getting things that look like percentages. The machine already put all the percentages together. So now the user just has to go and says, oh, it's percent, 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 percent. Otherwise, the user will say, oh, percent. No, so now I have a complex unit. Now I have something that looks like, oh, is it percent or is it a number? Or is it some? We want to make it as easy as possible. And this is why we need the machine learning. And uh, any more questions? So, you're asking about how medical units relate to other units used in other fields like, med uh, like physical units, like meters, meters squared. Good. So, so if you look at UKUM, do you remember I told you the standard called UKUM? This is a way to assemble uh, units from those small little, uh, small little elements. UKUMs actually are mapped here. This is why I use the mapping to UKUMs. Once you have things as UKUMs, it's easier. The problem is that if you look at those units, yeah, it's kind of a language of combining the, uh, the units, uh, kind of. Uh, check out the, the website, they have much better explanation, but uh, this is basically what UKUM is. Yes, you want to be able to, to do this, but currently you've seen the problem. The problem is at the level of Oh, I misspelled this uh, uh, unit. Oh, no, I have this unit with a Unicode character. And I, instead of... E e exactly, you need to clean up the data there. And we're trying, once you clean it up, then later a machine can do it much better. But this process of cleaning up has to be done. And this is what this project is for. So this is an ongoing project. If someone is interested in collaboration or uh, contribution or everything, please come talk to me. And uh, my time is up. Thank you very much.